Hi and welcome to Worlds Apart, a program that is committed to speaking the truth in love. I'm your host Rama Gassain and today we have with us Jay Smith, who will be speaking to us about ideologies that are worlds apart. Welcome to the show Jay. Hey Rommel, thanks and once again. <laughs> it's a real pleasure to have you come here and share some of your insights with us. I mean we've been talking about a lot of different things. Mm. Essentially, what I would like to find out in this episode is where can we find true peace? Comparing Islam with Christianity. All right, this is, this is a good one. This is a very timely one because this is the question most people are asking today, is it not? Mm. You know, all over the world, we're seeing violence uh, that has been done supposedly in the name of religion. And of course, Muslims especially are concerned with this because a lot of people assume that Islam is a religion of, of violence, but Muslims would very clearly say, no, it's a religion of peace. Mm. And they say, look at Salam, means peace, and Islam is from the same root. Now, if you speak Arabic, you know that they're, really they're two completely different form verbs. Salam is a first form verb, Islam is a fourth form verb. So it's not really correct to say that one can be interchanged with the other. Uh, obviously, the, the people that are saying that, Muslims that are saying that don't know Arabic. That, nonetheless, Salam does mean peace, Islam means obedience and submission. So to answer that question, you need to say, you need to go back to that which they submit to, that which they obey, that's what they're in obedience to, and it's this book right here. Mm. So really, let's come back to this book, because certainly the vast majority of Muslims you meet do say, I, we are a religion of peace, and I, I don't doubt them, I believe that. Mm -hmm. uh, the vast majority of Muslims in Australia, in the UK, in America, in the West, they would all say, yes, we are a religion of peace. Uh, yes, this book is a book of peace. Yes, uh, the prophet is a man of peace. And I hear that over and over again. And they have to say that. God mm. bless them. They're living in the West. Yes. You don't dare say any other. Because <laughs> right. you, uh, you won't last very long. Your credibility won't last very long if you say any other. Because mm. nobody wants a religion of violence. Mm -hmm. Not today. Yes. Because of the violence that's happening around the world. So therefore, it stands to reason that they'll say that. The difficulty with them is they're going to have to prove it to us. They're going to have to convince us. And what I do with Muslims all the time, I say, I don't want to hear your opinion of what your opinion is of what Islam believes because everybody's opinion is going to change. Don't even trust my opinion. Mm. Whenever I do a debate, Rommel, uh, with a Muslim, I always start the debate by saying, everything you as a Muslim says, I assume you're going to take from Scripture. Yes. You're going to support it in Scripture. Yes. And that everything you model will be modeled by your Prophet Muhammad. Mm -hmm. And I'll demand the same thing of myself. Everything that I say must come from Scripture especially the New Testament, because the New Testament is my, is my authority for today. That which I follow is in the New Testament. I don't follow the Old Testament model. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see where I'm going to go with this. Of course. And the model, the paradigm that I must follow must be Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Once I ask them that, and once they affirm that that's what they're going to do and that's what I'm going to do, as soon as I've shaken hands with them, I've won the debate, mm. especially on this issue. How's that? Well, because they're going to have to come back to this book. Mm -hmm. And I'll say to my Muslim friend, and I'll say this to Muslims who are listening right now, show me in the Quran where it says you're to have peace. Mm. Where are those verses there? I've asked this to many Muslims. I've done many debates on this. And there's a problem. There's a dearth of verses. There's about three that I've heard Muslims use. Let me just go to those three right now. And uh, for those of you who are listening, write these down. Surah 2, Ayah 256. Surah 2, Ayah 190. And Surah 5, Ayah 32. Those are the ones that I've heard over and over again, those three verses. Mm -hmm. Let's look at them and unpack them a little bit. And you'll see them on the screen be below you. Surah 2, Ayah 256 says very simply, for there is no compulsion in religion. That seems pretty peaceful. Peaceful. Mm. You don't enforce your religion on any other. Your beliefs, That's yes. That's right. You don't enforce your beliefs on any other. So it sounds very peaceful. Until you realize when that verse was revealed. And according to the exegesis, according to the exegetes, according to the science of exegesis, that verse was revealed to the Prophet when he first moved to Medina 
uh, between 622 and 624. Now we know that when he first moved to Medina, he was trying to make a relationship and have a relationship with the Jews. So there would stand a reason that a verse like that would be, would, would be revealed to him. There is no compulsion in religion, so he, didn't, uh, he really did scare off the Jews. The problem is, in the Quran, there are many verses that contradict each other. If you look at the Quran, there's about 220 verses that are contradictory. Wow. We don't have time to go into all of them, but uh, just take my word for it. The Muslims, if you disagree with that, uh, look at my paper that's up online. You can go to debate.org.uk and look at my uh, paper on the Quran. We go through about 50 of the, the, the most vivid contradictions in the Quran. So uh, certainly Muslim scholars know that there are many contradictions in the Quran. Because of that, there needs to be a, a law that, that, that alleviates that problem. Explanation. And there's, yeah. there's a law in the Quran that alleviates that. It's called the law of abrogation. Hmm. The law of abrogation, any good Muslim exegete knows this law. And it's found in Surah 2, Ayah 106, and Surah 16, Ayah 101. In both those references, as you can see at the bottom of your screen here, Surah 2, Ayah 106, and both 16, Ayah 101, stipulate that that which we give, a verse that we give, Mansuk, it, we give something better, Nasik. Okay. Mansuk is weak, Nasik is strong. So if you have a weak verse, always, 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 the later verse is strong. Mm. So it's, a one of, it's one of time. So it supersedes it. Anything that comes after supersedes it. Okay. Anything that comes after it abrogates it. Mm. So any verse that's found early, if you find any verse that contradicts it and it comes after, it destroys it or abrogates it. Surah 2, Ayah 256, was revealed during a period uh, between 622 and 624. There's 101 verses that come after that say just the opposite. Wow, that's Which, a problem. therefore, they abrogate it. And these are called the Medinan verses. Mm. Enormous amount of verses, 101 of them, that abrogate it. So obviously, it's a very weak verse. So mm. why are they even going to that? And by that time, usually what my Muslim friends do is they jump to Surah 2, Ayah 190. If they should attack you, Defend yourself, but do not go beyond the limits. I'm paraphrasing right here. Okay. Do not go beyond the limits. What limits? Good question. <laughs> You'd like to know, wouldn't you? Yeah, that's right. What are the boundaries? Well, you need it. In fact, let's open it up so we know what we're talking okay, about. Yeah. Okay. Surah 2, Ayah 190. So I don't want to. I don't want to hurt Muslim sensibilities if I misquote it. 190. It's very clear. Now remember, this are this is what in Hilali and Khan. If your Quran is written by or translated by another translator, it may be a few verses before and after, uh, because. Versification is not standardized in the Quran. Hmm. And fight in the way of Allah, those who fight you, but transgress not the limits. Now, your question is, what limits? Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to know. Look at the very next verse, 191. And kill them wherever ye find them, and turn them out from where they have turned you out. No so limits, what limits there. are there? There's no Once limits. you've killed them. You've just broken them. Actually, basically, this is not very peaceful if you look at the context. Because mm. the context is very clear, is that you're, you, can, you can kill them, destroy them. That's not very peaceful, and that's not a solution. Usually then they go to Surah 5, Ayah 32, and I think it's best if we just read it uh, so, the, so we don't misconstrue it. In Surah 5, Ayah 32, this is the story, actually verse 31 is the story of Cain and Abel. Cain kills his brother Abel, doesn't know what to do with the body. Uh, he sees a raven scratching in the ground, burying its partner, so he decides to follow the example of the raven. Now the very next verse in 32, it says this, Because of that, we ordain for the children of Israel that if anyone killed a person not in retaliation of murder or to spread mischief in the land, it would be as if he killed all mankind. And if anyone saved a life, it would be as if he saved the life of all mankind. That yeah, sounds like a redemption analysis. Mm. Don't kill, save. If you kill one, you've killed everybody. If you mm. save one, you've saved everybody. That makes sense. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Mm. There's a problem. Why is that? Well, look who it's, look who it's written to. Who? At the very beginning of this, it says, we ordain for the children of Israel. Mm. So who is this writing to? To Jews? This is to Jews. This is for Jews if you kill one, it's as if you kill all. Mm. Oh, Jews, if you save one, it's as if you save all. This is wow. not even written for Muslims. Wow. So you need to look at the whole context of the verse. Now, many of my radical Muslim friends, they'll say, yes, yes, that's true, Mr. Smith, but this, the whole Quran is written for Muslims. And so therefore, what they'll say, me, they'll say to me is, yes, though it says children of Israel, it really means to us Muslims. But they would say, and this is the great way, they come to me and they say, Mr. Smith, if you want to see who this is, it's not if anyone would kill all mankind, it's just if anyone would kill 
a Muslim, it's as if they killed all Muslims. Therefore, if anyone was to save a Muslim, it's as if they saved all of Muslims. Therefore, it's impinging upon me, they tell me, that I must go to Bosnia, I must go to Kosovo, I must go to Iraq and Afghanistan and Kashmir. Anytime one Muslim is killed, as if all Muslims are killed. Therefore, I must save the life of a Muslim so that I save the life of all Muslims. And they quote this verse all the time wow. because they don't care about the context. And once you've done that, you can just throw the verse out the window. Because a liberal Muslim will, will uh, interpret this verse one way without even looking at the context of the children of the Jews, uh, children of Israel, and a radical Muslim over here on the right will, will interpret it a completely different way. There is no context for the many Muslims, and that's why you need to be careful with Scripture. Mm. Thank God we look at always the context. Now, here's what my radical Muslim friend will then say to me. He say, listen, Mr. Smith, you know good and well that the most authoritative part of the Quran is this part of the Quran, the first part, the Medinan. Because these are the verses that were revealed to the Prophet between 622 and 632, the last 10 years of his life. Mm -hmm. And you must go to the last one, the very last surah, surah 9, which is the most authoritative one, because it was revealed or it was cut down, according to my radical Muslim friends, and most every Muslim exegete would agree with this. It was sent down in 632, the last year, the final year of Muhammad's mm -hmm. life. Therefore, oh, it's the most authoritative uh, surah in the entire Quran. Okay. When you go to Surah 9, it is not pleasant reading. What's it say? No. Surah 9, Ayah 5, call the sword verse. Slay the unbeliever wherever ye find them. Besiege them. Lay in wait for them with every kind of ambush. Ooh, doo -doo -doo -doo. That doesn't sound very peaceful, does it? No. It's... I remember doing a debate with uh, Azam Tamimi uh, in Cambridge University. Azam Tamimi is head of the Hamas party there in Britain, and he's on television quite often, well-known, spoken, a charismatic individual. I asked him to exegete that verse. He said, Mr. Smith, that stuff has nothing to do with you. Don't worry. I said, why not? He said, well, they slay the unbeliever. The unbeliever in, uh, in, in Arabic is mushrikun. A mushrik is someone who commits shirk. Un would be masculine plural. Mm -hmm. So someone who commits shirk, slay them. Who is that? Well, I thought that means me. I, I thought Muslims always call me a mushrik <laughs> because well, I believe that God is God came in the form of Jesus. And you believe that I've created Jesus, made him into a God. So have I not committed shirk? He said, no, 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 it's not you, he said. I said, Whew, that's a relief. So who was it? <laughs> he said, it's the pagans. I said, well, then, okay, who are the pagans today? He says, it's the idolaters. I said, well, then who are the idolaters? It's the Hindus. Now, it just so happened in that debating hall, half the audience were made what? up of Hindu <laughs> Cambridge students. Oh, you wow. do not say it. There was a gasp in the audience. Ah. And in Cambridge Union, whenever you, uh, at the end of a debate, you have either one of two doors that you go out of. You either go with the proposition, you go out with the opposition. I was arguing for the proposition that day. Over 400 went out with the proposition. Only around six or seven went out with the opposition. And it wasn't wow. myself. I didn't win that debate. It was that verse. Mm. That's what lost it for him. It was the Quran that lost it for him because of what it says. Wow. Now, I said, okay, so Surah 9, Ayah 5 does not deal with me. What about verse 29? Surah 9, Ayah 29 says, and make war on the Al-Kitab, make war on the people of the book. That's me. You're to make war upon me. Until when? Until I pay the zakat. What's the zakat? That means the tax. Wow. Which only the people of the book and those who, uh, the pagans, the non-Muslims, the non-believers had to pay. Hmm. The, the jizya tax and the kharaj tax is what we had to pay. The zakat means until I pay the, actually what Muslims pay, the zakat, mm. which is one of the five pillars. Now, by that time, he said, can we change? He wanted to move on. He did not want to continue with those verses. You could see. And I said, okay, let's go to Surah 8, Ayah 39. Surah 8, Ayah 39 is also very specific. Surah 8, Ayah 39, I'll read it to you so you can see what I'm talking about. And it says very clearly, and fight them until there is no more fitna. That means no more disbelief. And the religion will all be for Allah. You're to fight me until we all become Muslims, is what it's saying. Until we all believe in Allah. Not the Allah of the Bible, the Allah of the Quran. Wow. So I said, that's hugely interesting to me. Hmm. Then I went to Surah 47, Ayah 4. Surah 47 is also a Medinan Surah. And Surah 47, Ayah 4 is very clear. In fact, it's fascinating because the first three verses in Surah 47 define who a believer is and who an unbeliever is. And it says a believer is this, an unbeliever is this, a believer is this, an unbeliever is this. And then in verse 4, it says, So when you meet those who disbelieve, smite their necks till when you have killed and wounded many of them, then take bind a bond firmly. That doesn't sound very peaceful. doesn't sound very peaceful, does it? No. Nah. Muslims will try to say yes, but this is done in the context of the war. Well, let's go on to verse 6. He who guide them and set right their state and admit them to paradise, which he has made known to them. O you who believe. So 
before we do that, let's continue with verse 4. Let me, uh, let's back up, in fact, because you understand what I'm talking about. Thus, uh, and I want to come on down, but if it has been Allah's will, he would himself could certainly have punished them. But in order to test some of you with others, that those who are killed in the way of Allah, this end of uh, verse 4, he will never let their deeds be lost. He will guide them and set them right to their state, verse 6, and admit them to paradise. So those who are killed in the fight, the in the battle mm -hmm. of smiting and cutting off the heads of the unbeliever, he will admit them to paradise if they should die. Remember I said in another episode before that there's no assurance of salvation? Yes. I lied. There is one there. Right there. Can you see? There is a assurance of salvation in verse 6 of chapter 47. So you're telling me it's some type of reward for killing someone? There you go. In fact, the only assurance you can have is if you, sh if you die in the context of jihad, you will go straight to heaven. Now can you understand why so many young men are volunteering themselves mm, to die in the cause of Allah? Because it's straight out of the Quran. Hmm. So for Ayah 76 says the same thing. They're simply following what's written there. It's falling right out of the Quran. That's why we have to come back to this book. Now I've just given you what four or five verses. Hmm. Do you know how many verses there are on violence in the Medina Surahs? No, no 149. Wow. 149 verses. That's very clear. Verse after verse after verse after verse. If you have any doubt, come up to our website. You'll see it on the bottom of the screen here. It's not a minority. It's not something that's small. You can throw away or erase, this is a big portion, it's very this clear. This is a huge part and it's all in the Medinan surahs. Remember the law of abrogation stipulates that that which becomes later, that which becomes after is the most authoritative More, part. Okay. Now let's move on and let's say, hold on a minute. We, ne we need to be careful how we exegete verses, right? Mm -hmm. We need to be careful because uh, in my Bible, I'm very careful that I always look at the context and I always want to know what the author intended. A good exegesis means we need to go, we need to look behind what the author intended. So we need to find out what is the author saying in these verses. We mm -hmm. need to exegete it properly. The problem is, is this. Who is the author of this book? Uh, it's supposed to be Allah. Is that right? Allah doesn't read and write, doesn't come to earth and write. Who actually wrote down these words? Well, it was Muhammad that said Muhammad to... couldn't read or write. Well, didn't he tell his followers? To, okay, to... so actually you need to go back and see who these followers are. Now, that's a whole other subject we can talk about another okay, time. Who okay. wrote the Quran? Uh -huh. But who is it revealed to? To Muhammad. Muslims. Oh, Muhammad. For Muhammad is the man who would be the one we need to go to to see how he applied this. Uh, that's right. The yes. application must come through Muhammad's example, right? Exactly. And remember I said, whenever I start a debate, I always ask my Muslim uh, debater, are you going to use Muhammad as your paradigm, as your mm. model? We need to go back to Muhammad to see how Muhammad dealt with these verses. And mm -hmm. when you go back to Muhammad, just look at his, the, his biography. Just look at what he did between 624 and 632, what did the he last do? eight years of his life. What did when he you do? go to Ibn Hisham and when you go to al waqidi who write the earliest biography, the, the Siratul Rasulullah, which is the earliest biography, of the prophet himself. You can see that he was involved with raid after raid after raid after raid after raid. He was involved in over 29 battle campaigns himself personally wow. and he planned another 39 on top of that. Sounds like a general. Absolutely. His whole life was full of violence. So the way he applied it is very clear. If he is the arbiter of scripture, if he is the one that models scripture, his model is not a peaceful model. Mm. Look and see what he did to the Jews living in Medina there. There were three Jewish tribes living in Medina. The Banu Kainuka family, the Banu Nadir family, the Banu Guraiza family. These are the three great Jewish tribes that basically controlled the commerce. That's why he was asked to come up there in 622 to arbitrate between the Jews and the Ansar. He was asked by the Ansar to arbitrate as a neutral arbiter. Mm -hmm. What did he do? He tried to make a relationship with the Jews for the first two years, that didn't work because they rejected him as a prophet for the four criteria that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Once they rejected him, he rejected them. And at the Battle of Badr, the first great battle, he comes back from that battle victorious, turns on the first Jews and says, why didn't you support me? Hmm. And he threw them out of Medina. So the first Banu Kainuka family were thrown out of Medina in 624. A year later, the um, uh, Meccans come to retaliate against that defeat. And in 625, they had the Battle of Uhud. And the Battle of Uhud went, went badly against the Medinans. In fact, Muhammad was almost killed. Mm -hmm. Comes back gravely wounded, having lost the battle, proving that he could not win this battle, that God was not on his side. He was angered. He turned to the next Jewish tribe, blamed them for not supporting him, and he threw the Balon Nadir out, out, and they sent him up packing up to Khaybar. Two years later, in 627, the Battle of the Trenches. This is the third great battle where they dug a trench so that the Meccans could not come across. It was a stalemate battle, neither side won. He came back angered that the Jews did not support him and therefore he confronted the last remaining Jewish tribe, the Banu Qurayza family. After 21 days of confronting them, they could not take it any longer. He then took every one of their 800 men, all 800 men, mm -hmm. 10 at a time and slipped their throats. Killed all 800 men one afternoon. Is this a peaceful man? No. 
is this a peaceful way of dealing with a problem within no. your ranks? No. Were the Jews happy with that? Of course Absolutely not. Absolutely not. No. So within five years of his movement up there, from five years of coming to Medina, from 622 to 627, he basically eradicated all the Jews. Either threw them out, wow. cut off their throats, enslaved the women, uh, and took the women as concubines for his men and enslaved the children. Look, honestly, I've heard enough. I'm convinced. Okay. But can we now compare that to the Bible? There we go. Tell me, is Christianity a peaceful religion or a violent one? Why? Well, we need to come back to Jesus Christ. Why is it I'm not going back to the Old Testament? I don't know. Tell me. Because it's not my authority. Mm. I don't go back to Moses to know how I'm to live. If I go back to Moses, I'm going to have to start sacrificing. Ouch to the goat. That's I'm true. going to have to start circumcising. Ouch to me. I'm going to have to start executing my rebellious sons out to my boys. That's right. You're a follower of Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus. We need to follow his example. And, and he told Jesus us to do say? that. What does Jesus Did Jesus ever use violence? No. He was hated, was he not? Yes. He was vilified, was he not? Of course. He was deceived, was he not? Yes. He was whipped, was he not? Absolutely. He had to drag that cross through the streets, did he not? Mm, he yes. had thorns humiliated by those thorns on his head. He was put on the cross. How mm. did Jesus respond? What response? He accepted it. He took it. Father, forgive them, mm. for they know not what they do. What That's a right. contrast to Muhammad. Wow. You want to find peace, you better come back to Jesus Christ. Mm. Nowhere did Jesus use violence. Nowhere did he even allow those who supported him. Remember, the only time violence was ever used was by Peter. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the Jews had come to arrest him. What did he do? Peter took out a sword and cut off the ear of the servant. What That's did Jesus right. do? He immediately took the ear, put it back on the servant, turned towards Peter, and he said, Peter, put away your sword. Wow. Matthew 26, verse 52. For he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. Mm. There you go. It's so beautiful. Oh, I love the Bible. I love Jesus Christ. I love the gospel because the gospel of Jesus Christ is the gospel of peace. That's true. I mean, he commanded his disciples to do what? To love one another as he had loved them. And by this, the whole world, everybody else will know that you're my disciples. There you go. Verse that was a new verse commandment that he had given them. <laughs> Blessed wow. are the peacemakers. If someone slaps you on the one cheek, turn the other cheek. Nowhere does Jesus ever let, allow us to use violence. We must not use violence. Mm. Not with the new covenant, the covenant of Jesus Christ, which we fall under. That's all of us very fall clear. under. He is the man of peace. Now, people want peace today, do they not? Yes. Oh, man, everybody They're wants searching peace. for it. If you really wanted peace, Rommel, where would you go? Would you come back to this book? No. Not after what you've seen? No. Certainly, this book is not a book of peace. Mm. Would you come back to Muhammad? No. How can you? If I you look can't. at his example, no. look what he did to Asma, the poetess. What? Well, she wrote poetic verse against him when he first moved to Medina. He said, who's going to take me, rid me of this woman? Umer, the blind uh, disciple, goes that night and stabs her through the heart while she was suckling her baby. Comes back the next morning and oh. reports to Muhammad what he had done. And he turns to Umer and says, blessed are you. No longer are you Umer, the blind. You are Umer, the seeing. He basically uh, uh, commended, him. commended him for what he had just done. Is that the example of Jesus Christ? No. No. Oh, I love Jesus. Mm. Because Jesus is the model for today. Mm -hmm. 2,000 years ago, he was telling us to put away our sword. 2,000 years ago, he was telling us to love our enemies. 2,000 years ago, he was telling us to turn the other cheek. 2,000 mm. years, ago, years ago, he was saying, blessed are the peacemakers. And if it was good enough in the first century, it's good enough in the 21st century. That's right. That's our man. Yes. That's our revelation. Mm. And that's our model for today. You want peace? Yes. You better come back to Jesus. Come on <laughs> home. Come on home. Isn't he great? That's why I love to talk about him. Do Muslims know this? I think Muslims have to realize that there's nothing that they can find wrong with Jesus. Are they offended by him? Uh, we'll talk about that. They're not offended by him. They're offended by what he said. Can they see that he's a man of peace? I'm asking Muslims today, look at Jesus anew. Come back and read his scriptures. Don't make up your mind already. If you really want peace, and I know you do, you want, I hear you all the time saying you want peace. Come on home to Jesus Christ. Come on home to his gospel. This truly is the gospel of peace, and it's for you. Hmm. Jay, thank you once again. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Thank you for sharing this information with us. If I can just turn to our audience now and say to them, you heard Jay say it, but don't just take his authority. Don't just simply take what he said as gospel. Go back to the scriptures, read the gospels, read the New Testament, and tell me, who do you find Jesus to be? A warrior? A rebel? A renegade? Did he incite the people? Did he call some type of riots in the streets? Or was he simply preaching peace? Everybody is searching for peace. Are you searching for peace? If you want this peace, you can find it in a person. 
in a relationship. Once again, as we have been saying, please listen to the things that have been spoken on this episode. And don't forget to stay in tune to the very next episode. May God bless you. Thank you very much.